Welcome everyone to another exciting webinar in our Legal Lens on Women's Health series. Today we are discussing age in your career. My name is Pamela Meals and I will be your moderator today. I'm very pleased to introduce your esteemed panel today. First we have Dr. Paula Rashan, is the current Vice President of Research at the Women's College Hospital. She's a geriatrician and health services researcher. Her research focuses on understanding the unique needs of older adults, most of whom are women. Much of her clinical work as a geriatrician, in conjunction with her extensive research, has laid the foundation of her expertise on aging adults. Dr. Rashan's research explores how to promote health in aging adults, and her work has contributed substantively to the areas of focus that affect individual patients and healthcare systems one of which includes the need for evidence to provide information that is more relevant to women and men. Thank you for being here, Dr. Rashan. Barbara Miller is a partner at Airden Burles, a commercial litigator and a member of the firm's labor and employment team. She's appeared before all levels of court, including the Supreme Court of Canada, as well as various boards and tribunals. Barbara represents many employer clients in connection with, among other things, human rights, employment standards, wrongful dismissal, employment agreements, and applications respecting violations of labor standards. Thank you, Barbara, for being here. Rachel Blumenfield is a partner at Airden Burles, where she's a member of the firm's estates and trust group and tax group. Rachel advises clients on many estates, tax, and succession planning matters, such as estate planning and administration, preparation of wills, power of attorney documents, business succession, and insurance planning. She has significant experience with cross-border planning for clients who have U.S. or other foreign connections. She also works with families with disabled children to plan and struggle their, street, their estates appropriately. Thank you, Rachel. And that leaves me. As I previously <laughs> stated, my name's Pamela Meals. I'm a partner in the litigation group at Airden Burles and co-chair of the firm's Women's Initiative Committee. I have a broad commercial litigation practice that includes an emphasis on contractual disputes, short-term and long-term disability claims, and life insurance claims. Health and employment issues are key components of my disability claims, so I'm very excited to be here and moderate this lovely panel. Aging's inevitable, but staying healthy in the workplace until you're ready to retire is not. What can one do to ensure you remain healthy, happy, and efficient throughout your career? This is an important question that we all need to ask, so let's get started. Our first topic that Dr. Rashawn will cover is gender in healthcare and in the workplace, health and social issues women face, and how they may affect career progression. We look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Rashawn. Please take it away. So thank you very much and good morning everyone. So I'd like to start by talking a bit about why it's important to focus around issues related to health and wellness that specifically impact women and how these issues can translate into experiences in a professional environment. Now, women unfortunately face a number of health care gaps that um, are concerning because these gaps can be putting their health and well-being at risk. And where I'm based at Women's College, we call this the health gap. And one of our big priorities that we're focusing on is identifying and closing these gaps through the work that we do, particularly through research and through our clinical care. Now, this health gap starts in a number of different ways. But one way to think about it, it starts with the underrepresentation of women uh, in science. And this is a big issue because when they're not included in the science that's conducted, that means that the treatment programs that we ultimately get as a result of this research do not necessarily adequately uh, represent women. It also means that symptoms and risk factors for serious diseases that affect women differently may be overlooked. And as a result of that, the health services that arise don't necessarily consider the unique challenges that women may face that may prevent them from accessing those services. And it goes on from there. So there are a number of consequences of the health gap um, that we might think about. One of them that relates to the, a lot of the work that I've done relates to overprescribing of medications. It's also the lack of awareness among health professionals as how certain very common conditions like things like health disease, 
health or heart disease or diabetes can actually present differently in women than they would in men. And this is particularly true, I think, for women who are older. Uh, drug studies, for example, often under-report um, or underrepresent older people, despite the fact that this is the group that actually uses the most drug therapies. Uh, older people, especially women, live longer on average than men. This is something that's been documented in many societies and for many, many years. But they're much more likely to have chronic conditions and therefore require different kinds of drug therapies. So when studies don't report on differences between women and men, we miss out on important information regarding the way in which women's medical care could be tailored uh, more to more appropriately uh, meet their needs. So at Women's College, our ultimate goal relates to equity and to building a more equi equitable health care system. And in that regard, it's one that addresses the unique needs of every individual regard regardless of their sex. But the work also has to extend well beyond the health system. Improving gender equity in health care relies on progress towards gender equity in all facets of society, including the workplace, and that is in particular what we're going to be talking about today. And that's because, you know, socioeconomic circumstances of women across all de different kinds of demographics have an impact on their experience with the health care system. So thinking specifically about the workplace, Professional environments that don't recognize the unique challenges that many women face may inadvertently be having a negative impact on their health and well-being, creating a gap that we believe has consequences for the tra trajectory of that woman's career and for her future um, prospects. So very important. Now we're talking about sex, we're talking about gender. I think it's important to spend a few minutes looking at the terminology. And so we have a really nice slide up here for you to, to look at. So sex and gender are two different but related concepts, and it, they're concepts that people tend to mix up a lot. So sex is something when we're talking about biologic issues. So it's about chromosomes, it's about reproductive organs. When we're talking about gender, this is something that's shaped by social kinds of factors. So on your slide there, you'll see a picture uh, in the corner of uh, a sort of a girl's room where everything is pink and pretty and princessy. And on the other side, you'll see a boy in a boy's room where everything is blue and kind of busy. And that sort of speaks to what gender is talking about in particular. So gender um, manifests in a variety of different ways. And one of the ways that it comes up is caregiving. And the second uh, relates to risk profile for health issues such as chronic disease and mental health challenges. So maybe let's focus a little bit on caregiving. When it comes to caregiving, whether it's for young children or for an older parent or a relative, women really take on the majority of the responsibilities and this is even the case if both individuals are in the workforce. And despite making a lot of progress over the past few decades, I think it's fair to say that Canadian women still continue to take on the majority of the parental responsibilities and are the, the group that will take more leaves uh, related to um, these sorts of responsibilities. At the same time as women are uh, potentially uh, involved in the child care of their, of their children, women often are also called upon to assist with older family members, relatives, uh, parents, whoever it might be. And as a result of that, there's been a term that I'm sure you've heard called the sandwich generation. And for many of you uh, who have been through that sort of experience, I'm sure you can attest that this can be very stressful, it can be very exhausting, and it can be difficult to balance your work as well as these different uh, caregiving types of responsibilities. And sometimes it means that women have to step out of the workplace or do, often temporarily, but sometimes it ends up being permanently, and uh, that's an issue we want to discuss. In fact, in the medical world where I work, studies have shown that female physicians are more likely to reduce their professional hours to care for children and that they manage more household responsibilities compared to their spouse. 
Uh, and I'm sure that this same thing applies to many other professions. I can just speak to my own uh, kind of experience. But it does mean potentially from an employee perspective that there's a loss of a very uh, valuable talent. Often women choose to leave the workforce where, you know, perhaps top students and rising stores, and they actually, you know, bring very unique and diverse perspectives which are very valuable to the workplace. Um, it's interesting that uh, in an article that was published in The Atlantic, which is maybe relevant to many people on the phone, a woman describes her decision to resign from the law firm where she'd just been made partner, and she made this decision before she had her child. And it was basically because she felt that she couldn't be giving her full to, um, to both of these things simultaneously, and so she made the decision to leave. Uh, similarly, a paper that uh, we wrote about women in academic medicine, uh, one of the things uh, the former chair of, in the, of the Department of Medicine at University of Toronto commented on, she was a woman, she said that she had a lot of challenge recruiting women into leadership roles and it was you know, not because they weren't outstanding scholars and great physicians and had you know, great reputations as educators, but they just said, I have too many commitments. I just can't take on anything else. I have my kids, my parents. I just don't have time. I can't do it right now. So I, I think these are real issues. Uh, and in terms of caregiving for aging relatives, it's estimated that about you know, more than 60% of caregivers are women. The average caregiver is a woman who works outside of the home and also provides, you know, tens of hours per week of unpaid care for other people. Uh, and these, especially for women, caregiving duties for older relatives often occur, occur when they're sort of the mid to the late point of their career, at a time when they are having themselves more responsibilities in the workplace and exiting is even more difficult at that time. And so I, I think this is a sort of an issue we don't often think about because we think maybe women are, are through sort of uh, time periods when they may be having caregiving issues. But it's important to think about that and the potential toll that it takes on their physical and mental well-being. Let's move to a little bit about uh, chronic uh, diseases. So women, uh, for example, are more likely to develop chronic conditions than men. This is something that's been documented for some time. And they're more likely to live with these chronic conditions. So that's another piece. So it's, some, it's things like arthritis. Arthritis is more common in women. Blood pressure may be more of an issue when women uh, get more sort of into the menopause kind of uh, phase of their lives. And common conditions like thyroid disease, seven times more common in women than men. And because women have these multiple conditions, they're also more likely to be using drug therapies to manage these conditions, which is very appropriate. And it's sometimes uh, because of this, they're at more risk for drug-related problems, which is something to think about. Women also may experience mental health challenges, and I know this is a topic that you've spoken about before. And sometimes these are exacerbated during different points in their lives, like maybe around pregnancy, and sometimes around uh, uh, later in their lives, maybe perhaps around menopause. And there's also, maybe from a gender perspective, uh, some issues that perhaps women are more likely to be prescribed therapies for these um, conditions. So that's something to think about. So let's look at women in the workplace. What do these factors of caregiving and health, con health considerations mean when it comes to women in the workplace? So for me, you know, ra rather than sort of thinking of things necessarily being in a linear path, when many women experience, I think, ups and downs in their careers, which are really important to think about. In my own experience, and this is illustrated on the slide here, it shows uh, years since I started my career by number of publications, and publications are something we use in the sort of the medical world and in the science world to document success. And you'll notice there at the start of my career, when I just moved back to Toronto from the States, when I was starting my first clinical job, taking on my first appointment at the university. I also had three children in quick succession, and that was my five-year time period to sort of prove myself in the scientific world. So as you can imagine, my publications were kind of slow at that time. Uh, but uh, over time, uh, they picked up and everything uh, was fine. But I found that time point for me very discouraging because I didn't know that that was maybe not a unique thing for me, that it was something that other women might experience. And I, I, had I been more aware that my experience was not unique, I think I would have been less discouraged. And so 
I, personally, it would have helped me a lot if I had had um, other people to talk about and other experiences that I, I could have um, benefited from to let me know that that, in fact, wasn't uh, a, a unique situation. And it's, it's times like this where a lot of women will move out of the workforce. Uh, so one of the things we have to also think about is in the medical world, a lot of women are not moving to the senior roles. So, for example, in Toronto, uh, among the nine teaching hospitals at the University of Toronto, there are only two female vice presidents of research, and one of them is myself. So uh, it is an issue in terms of people de developing uh, their uh, careers and being encouraged to continue and not to drop out of the profession. One of the things that I think can make a big difference uh, for women and men is, um, is to have uh, mentors. Men continue to make up the majority of scientists in Canada. Women's college is, I think, a very important exception in this regard where the majority of our scientists are women, and that this is something that I think we're very, very proud of. Um, but it's one of the things when you're trying to encourage women to stay in science and women to stay in their professions is mentorship is something that's really important. Women want mentors, but it's often very difficult to find female mentors in their profession because uh, these mentors can have such a positive impact on their career. Uh, certainly, I, I think this is something that is really, really important. With women living longer and working longer and contributing more than ever to the workforce and the economy, it's a crucial that we start to think about how do we address these issues for both an employee and an employer to find solutions that will allow women to advance and flourish in their uh, careers. This ensures, I think, that the employer's business is benefiting from the diverse pers perspectives that women bring to the work Course. Now, anecdotally, many women, I think, or at least they're telling me this, are finding their stride later in their careers, after they've finished raising their children for the most part. This points to the importance of investing early in women's careers, providing solid mentorship to help them get through these challenging years and get them onto the path uh, later on so they can continue to contribute at greater and greater levels. So investing is really important uh, in these careers. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Rashan. I agree with you, and I think that's why a number of the law firms now and other businesses, accounting firms, are taking these in, are starting these initiatives, these women initiatives, because we we are losing this amazing group of women to other factors, and and it's it's affecting our businesses as well. So, and I'm not sure if the hospitals are doing that, but uh, it is it is making a difference here. So, thank you again, and that is a great segue into a discussion around how workplaces can ensure that they're offering supportive environments that help women continue to pursue their careers while managing their health and caregiving responsibilities. So, Dr. Rushan, in your view, what are some of the key ways in which workplaces can support the unique challenges that women may face to help them better manage their career goals while ach achieving better health and balance? Well, I think... One of the first things is for people to be aware of the unique challenges that women are facing in their careers. And I, th I think sort of one of the things that, that I was just speaking about is that if, if people aren't thinking about these things or, or aren't having people that women in the workforce can speak to, it's really going unrecognized. Uh, and, and then the women are feeling left on their, on their own, aren't certain what to do, and that makes it more likely that perhaps they may decide that this isn't the career for them. So I think one of the, the starting points is we have to recognize it and we have to be talking about it like we are today. Right. I, just maybe to jump in a bit on sort of the experiences. I think, mean, Barbara, I, you may have had similar things. I, I think you're right. Early on in my career, there really were not a lot of female mentors or mentors at all. I don't think we even talked about that. But what I'm seeing, in the, the, the certainly here, uh, there really is a, for, first of all, there's a lot of female lawyers at different levels, at the, you know, at the associate level and as a, also at the senior partner and at the leadership levels. And I think it's really made a, a difference for women coming in, I hope, yes, <laughs> without looking yes, to you, that uh, they're, you know, the, the, the fact that there now are more women in, in law and at 
and advancing into the se more senior levels um, who are who are able to be mentors. Mm -hmm. kind of. um, yes, it's Barbara Miller speaking, and I and I understand exactly what you've just said. You and I are close in vintage, mm -hmm. and we've we've been through we've, we've been trench warfare for years in this profession. Um, almost everything I do in my practice, quite frankly, is with men in a boardroom. Mm -hmm. It sounds much more glamorous than it is. <laughs> But um, in any event, there are more women in this profession now. I represent mostly for my practice, for the most part, when I deal with employment matters, I deal, I represent employers. So I take, I, I see an approach to this different than Dr. Rashawn and some other women because I see it from a business perspective and I get to, to, I get to understand some of my clients and why they have difficulties. Um, when women are not in the workplace and they have to take time off, they have to go away for a year, now a year and a half when they have a child, I get that it becomes a business problem for the employer. However, most of my employer clients understand it might be a business problem, but sorry, we're governed by the law here. And many of those employer CEOs have wives, <laughs> have sisters, and many of them start to get it. However, employers play games. And sometimes I understand why the games are being played, but there are protections for these employees, for these female employees and male employees in the workplace. And some of the things Dr. Rashawn mentioned in her presentation made me think of, all right, well, there is a whole concept of accommodation. Your rights as an employee with respect to taking leaves, with respect to being away because you're ill, with respect to um, issues that arise because of a family issue. There's protections in legislation. For the most part, that legislation is the Human Rights Code. Probably many of you listening to this um, webinar today have, have um, tripped over that, that legislation. That legislation has been in place for a number of years, and it's changed over the years, but it's a fairly strong protection for a number of what they call protected grounds. Some of those grounds are, for example, your age, sex, disability, family status. Those things are somehow protected in this cocoon in this legislation, and that gives you rights that gives you rights to complain if you think your employer is not complying with the legislation. And there's, there's, it's not a slam dunk. I've had many cases for employers where employees make outlandish allegations about reasons they were treated a certain way. And the, the allegations don't mean much. You have to prove yourself in this legislation, which means at the end of the day, if you make a complaint and it's not settled, you have to go to a trial. And you, have to, and, and you have to be sworn in, and you have to call your witnesses, and you have to prove your case. So there is, um, there is a protection for employees. We can get into that maybe as Dr. Rashad and I speak about specifically some protections for family status, because that's the one I think that most people would be interested in and, and, and what exactly that means. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was a great discussion amongst the panelists. <laughs> Dr. Rushon, could you speak in more detail about some of the specific ways in which women can achieve longevity by addressing the challenges you discussed earlier? So, thank you so much. Um, the question really is, how can we address the health and well-being of women in the workplace to support longevity in life and at work? And I'd like to outline a few suggestions uh, that range from how can we work together uh, towards a better balance as individuals, as families, as em and as employees. So when we're thinking about healthy aging, it's important to remember that we're all aging. And I find this one kind of, <laughs> kind of, you know, amazing. People always think of it as somebody, somebody else. else. <laughs> but uh, as a geriatrician, you know, it, to me it's something that we all should be thinking about. And in particular, it isn't something that we should start thinking about when we're in our 90s or whatever that age is. It's really something that we should be considering 
as we build and structure our lives and habits from a very early age. I mean, really, it's something from the time you're born, everyone's aging, and you should be thinking about your health and thinking about all of these sorts of things. Uh, and so there's some things that we can do to support our own longevity from a health perspective by taking some steps, I think, early on, really, to protect and enhance our well-being. And this is, I think, something that is really, really important for women. Uh, and, you know, of course, that's a topic of our conversation but who are living longer than ever before, and so it's increasingly important. So I've done, I did a, a study which I thought was really interesting about centenarians, like who's living to 100 uh, in the province. And interesting, you know, now in Ontario there's over 2,000 people who are over 100, and those numbers are, are large across the country and around the world. But interestingly, among people who are living to 100 or more, because it's not just 100, Almost all of them are women. And in the age group between 85 and 100, which is a very large age group and is like 120 times larger than the centenarian group and is growing at a very fast rate, that population, again, is predominantly women. So uh, when we, when we want to think about um, these issues, it's very important for women. Now, I think it's fair to say, and it probably no surprise to any of you, that no one has identified the secret to longevity. I mean, that would be a good <laughs> business. That's what we thought you were going to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and there's no single drug or pill or therapy that will guarantee it. And I don't think we want to wait for that pill because that may take a long time. But there are a number of factors that seem to promote healthy aging that have come out from the literature. And so those are the kinds of things that I want to talk about. Uh, and these factors are based not only on uh, experience, but also on evidence that are gathered primarily from, for example, long-lived communities, places in the world where people have lived exceptionally long lives and people have studied that, and also from data that's been collected from studies, uh, cohort studies, large groups of people that have been followed uh, to look at longevity, so the different groups of people around the world and um, people have followed to figure out what seems to contribute to longevity. And as a result of that, there's some key factors that emerge that I think are important to think about in terms of maintaining health, health and wellness. And now, interesting, a lot of these factors, when you hear them, you're going to say, okay, well, these sort of seem to be kind of common sense, and, and probably they are. And a number of them relate to the idea of kind of balance and moderation. So those are important to keep in mind. Um, so I guess I also had uh, the maybe unusual, but maybe not so unusual uh, opportunity, I guess, to see this firsthand through my own family members. And my grandfather, so a male, not a female, lived to be uh, almost 103. And so I know that that was one of the things that inspired me to think about geriatric medicine, but also made me reflect on sort of things that he had done in his life and maybe how that related also to longevity. So what are these sorts of uh, factors that people might want to think about? Well, one of the things people talk about are, is diet. And, you know, some people talk about you shouldn't be eating processed foods, that you should be eating foods in a much uh, more unprocessed state. And they talk about diets that include uh, vegetables and fruits and fibers. And the idea of healthy body weight. So it's not about extremes. It's about uh, sort of doing things that make sense. Which, and doing this sort of thing also in turn reduces the risk for certain chronic conditions, which also we know are associated with longe longevity. And so they also prevent other health kinds of issues uh, potentially from developing. Now having said that, uh, interestingly, you know, when I've looked at stories of people who've lived exceptional lives, there was one woman, uh, Jean Calmet, who I maybe mispronounced it, who is from France, who's apparently the oldest living w woman, and she lived to 122. And so somebody asked her, you know, what was your secret? You know, what did you do? What would you share? And I liked her secret. She said... Uh, she liked chocolate, That's so it was good, <laughs> and she mentioned poor wine, and uh, she, said, uh, she said olive oil, but I think that was for her skin. Anyway, uh, so you can, you can uh, take that as you will. So people also talk about exercise, and so the importance of regular exercise. Uh, and, you know, f so physical activity is associated with healthy aging. And I think, you know, too, sometimes people uh, feel that, you know, you have to go to the gym to exercise, and I guess... 
one of the maybe messages is that small amounts of exercises can, can be important. And it's something like, what can you do in your, in your own life? You know, how, where can you walk? Um, you know, it's just making a point of doing something on a, on a daily basis. So like a 15-minute walk a day, you know, may, that's a, maybe a good thing to think about. Or for us, you know, when we're coming to the professional world, you know, what about uh, when you're taking the subway, get off a little earlier, walk a little bit more? Um, you know, those are things that I think we honestly have to figure out how do you build this into your daily routine as opposed to making it something that's separate and apart. So that's um, sort of something to think about that comes out from some of this, uh, these studies. Another one which is maybe obvious is to not smoke, or if you do <laughs> smoke, to quit smoking. Maybe easier said than done. Um, but um, that's one of the things that people think is really important in terms of uh, health and longevity. Now one that you might not think about, and maybe you know, speaking to a group of women who are very busy and, as we said, you know, probably have lots of other responsibilities, I think this is an important factor. And it's the idea of social engagement. Um, so engaging with your family, with your friends, and the broader community. Because people sort of say, and when you go to sort of these long-lived communities, that those who are, who are connected, you know, they're out and they're, they're part of the community, they really tend uh, to... Uh, to to do better. So, and that's because they're participating in maybe healthy behaviors, they're maybe being more physically active because they're up and they're out and they're moving around, they're getting medical care when, when, it's, when they're needed, and as a result of that they have, you know, fewer maybe mental health concerns because they're more engaged, uh, and so it may help in that regard. But one of the pieces, it also reduces uh, isolation and loneliness and it really helps contribute to a sense of purpose. Now, I was interested in this concept of loneliness because it's been in the news recently, and I don't know if you saw it, but in the UK, they've now created a minister of loneliness to recognize how important this is to society. And, you know, how do you quantify how important this is or how important it is to preventing that sort of thing? But one of the pieces of information they put out was that um, loneliness is equivalent to smoking a number of cigarettes every day. So, you know, you, it, it is something that people uh, want to think about. How do, you, how do you try to mitigate that? I also thought there was an interesting idea out there that maybe we should spend time checking our relationship balance, just like we check our bank balance. And maybe that's something that we forget about. And I think it's important to ensure that we're actively participating in our community and maintaining our connections. And I know that that's something that's sometimes hard to do when, you know, you're trying to juggle a lot of different things. But that is one of the factors um, that's come out as being important. Uh, having a purpose is one that also comes out, and, and some people also relate this to things like uh, resilience. But it's, it's you know, for example, um, what can you be doing? So maybe it's volunteering for something that you believe in. Maybe it's uh, traveling. Maybe it's uh, things that you really are engaged in from a hobby perspective. Maybe it is related to the things that you're doing at work. But it's having some sort of a, a thing that matters to you. And this can really help, I think, improve things from a physical and emotional perspective. Another one which is maybe kind of obvious and something that we all maybe sort of struggle with is sleep. <laughs> and... Um, you know, people are laughing around the table here, and I'm sure other people are laughing too. But yeah, I mean, you know, we should all get enough sleep. So what do people talk about? They talk about seven hours of sleep, probably, is what people should think about. And that is supposed to maybe um, be good in terms of reducing problems related to s some chronic conditions or developing of some of those things. And it's important to get a good night's sleep, and so that's uh, an issue to think about, and there's a lot that we can talk about um, in that regard. But a lot of people, especially women, seem to report difficulty with their sleep or having trouble falling asleep. And um, this also then in turn relates to an issue that is sort of near and dear to my heart where then people get put on sleep aids to manage that problem, which is not necessarily in their best interest, and especially as women get older, can lead to other kinds of issues and concerns. Um, so that is something that I think we want to think about. But by trying to make sleep a priority and then trying to figure out a plan in that regard, I think um, that can make a big difference. 
Can I jump in just for and pick up on something that the, a couple things that you talked about uh, on the longevity issue? Because I am seeing I'm I'm an estate planner and I my client base tends to be old, you know in the 50 plus range, and I am seeing a lot more people in their 80s and 90s. And we get into issues around mm -hmm. capacity, and I think we can we can talk about that a bit more. But one of the other things that I see occasionally um, is the concern about longevity and financial security and am I you know people being concerned especially widows who are concerned about am I going to run out of money I mean you know I'm already 90 my mother lived to 90 I'm going to live to 100 um, <clears throat> how am I going how how what's that going to look like and you know I don't have answers to that but you know we do sit down and look at it and a lot of times um, you know, I think it's it's a concern it's a it becomes a concern for the whole family uh, and it can lead to to dissent in the, in the family, but yeah, we can we can get into that a mm -hmm. little bit more. But I think that that's been something that I see, and I am seeing families where there's a parent and who's hit a hundred, and and you know that, those kinds of issues become uh, come on on in the floor. Yeah, interesting <laughs> issue and a, a good problem to have, but well, but in, in a sense, but right. but it's an interesting <laughs> problem. Yeah, but it does it can I think create dissent yes. among the children and even the grandchildren mm -hmm. because they don't all agree on you know w how much mom should be spending f on that retirement home all right. yeah plus, very important uh, plus I'm assuming it would create stress yeah. physical mental stress that then would cause it, even health when issues. it's completely unwarranted mm -hmm. because you know mm -hmm. the there's enough there to support somebody for years and years but you know, especially if it's where it's been the, a traditional marriage, a traditional family, and the wife really has not had not a lot to do with the finances and doesn't understand, you know, that she has enough to to stay in this nice, much nicer retirement home, um, but feels, you know, the concerns about about you know how am I gonna how am I gonna li live there for another ten years? Very important so, yeah. to discuss. Very yeah. important. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So um, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about um, another factor working towards achieving greater equity and how we approach responsibilities relating to parenting and home maintenance. While there's been progress for women in this area, it's been moving at a slow pace. Um, although women are now um, equally almost equally in the workforce, this hasn't really translated into an equal split of unpaid labor at home. And I think we sort of touched on this a little bit before, but Statistics Canada recently suggested that women are spending on average 50, per, 50 hours per week on child care, more than double the average spent by their male partners. And of course, there's a lot of factors that make this issue complex, uh, but I think it is something that we need to think about. The, the message here is that things really need to change in some way as we work towards achieving sort of gender parity in the professional sphere, sphere so that we can continue to think about, you know, how is this going to relate to what's happening at home. And I think this requires uh, communications and uh, different kinds of conversations. And it involves being aware of the time demands that might impact women and how that relates to her health and then how that might in turn relate to how she's performing at work. So the solutions will certainly look different for every family, but it does begin with a conversation and taking small steps towards achieving better balance. So, so let's think about caregiving maybe for aging parents. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of caregiving duties for aging parents or loved ones tends to fall uh, to women, and, and women uh, also work outside the home. So there's, it's a very complex experience and conversations need to be navigated, particularly at a time when the individual being cared for is feeling, you know, kind of vulnerable in terms of their own health and future. And this can add additional stress to the whole issue about caregiving. So this stress isn't helpful when you're, when you're you know, you're managing a career as well or for anyone. And as a geriatrician, I think one of the things I really try to talk about, and I know we'll talk about this more, is to encourage families to mitigate some of 
these problems as much as possible by starting conversations about caregiving early on. And I think this starts with a conversation about understanding maybe what your parent or your family member's priorities for health care might be. When you don't know what those priorities are and you get into health care challenges, that creates a huge amount of stress, uh, such as, you know, for example, knowing, you know, did they want to eventually, if their health declines, remain in their home? Did they want to go to a, 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 a long-term care facility? Are they interested in retirement home? You know, what are their wishes in terms of what is a priority for them from a health perspective? So I think it's important to have an open dialogue about these priorities to help take away some of the stress, which I mean I just kind of can't underestimate because I see it so often in terms of what this means uh, to a family when they don't know what to do and this sort of the conflict that creates amongst a family when they're all trying to do the right thing and everyone's trying to guess what that right thing might mean. So I think to me that means practical things like sitting down together uh, and talking about uh, issues before major health issues arise and making decisions about how they're going to be managed uh, and establishing an understanding of your loved one's wishes for the future, their power of attorney, which I know we're going to we'll hear about that, their estate plans, their hopes, their expectations, how do they want their family involved in their care. And that can go a long way towards making this caregiving process much easier so that you're focusing on the things that, that matter and not getting caught up in some of these other pieces that could be dealt with in other ways. And this is one way that I think we can help yourselves and your loved ones prepare for the shift in roles that take place down the line and hopefully alleviate some of the emotional burden of decision making. Another very important factor for women who are balancing caregiving and this roles in their full-time uh, work schedules is self-care. And this is one that I don't think people pay enough, enough attention to. We often see women tend to put the needs of others before themselves, and they don't make time necessarily to ensure that they're looking after themselves too. The things we talked about are that you know their diet, their exercise, they're finding the time that they need to socialize and re relax. And over time, this can result in physical and emotional consequences, making it more difficult for women to really care for others as they develop these kinds of challenges. So it really is important to keep an eye on yourself too and to be honest with those around them about what you need to manage your own health and wellness. Um, you know, it's sort of like that thing you see on the plane, you know, you put your oxygen mask on first and then you help those around you. So the healthier you are and the better you are, the better you'll be able to provide care for those around you and to help yourself. <laughs> Uh, and as we discussed, working towards building a more supportive work environment that re recognizes the unique challenges placed by employees can go a long way uh, towards helping staff achieve uh, this better uh, mental, mental and physical health and um, by finding more balance in life. Yeah, I'd like to... Um, it, it's. It, I just wanted to comment, Dr. Rashawn, on something you said a few moments ago about um, <clears throat> health care and helping families and when there's issues with parents or children, how it is the, the, the woman who usually does it. I've been there. I get it. Um, uh, it it's just, uh, uh, you know, you remember when you go to the pediatrician with your child young, it's always the, the, the working moms or the moms that are in the room, not the dads. I get that. And from some of the questions that have been asked that we've received already, I think a number of people are interested in what rights do you have or what accommodation should there be when there are family issues. And that, that is a very interesting topic because, as I mentioned earlier, there, this Human Rights Code has this term, a protected code, called family status. And there's a whole line of cases now that relate to when someone needs accommodation because they have to pick their child up after school at a certain time or their wife's had surgery and nobody can look after the child. There's a number of those cases. And um, <clears throat> there was one that Dr. Rashawn and I talked about earlier. It was a case from a number of years ago where uh, there was a woman who um, applied for and was accepted for a job with um, customs. So she's at the airport um, as a customs, customs immigration officer when you come off your plane from a foreign land. 
And clearly that kind of position requires shift work. And that was one of the cases years ago where she complained and said, I can't do the night shift because of child care issues. And um, I, was, I was a bit stunned by the case a few years ago because the, it was a federal case because it, um, customs and immigration is a federal issue. But, and, I, and I can't recall, it must have, I can't even recall if it was a collective agreement case, it was a bargaining unit employee or not. But at the end of the day, the court said um, that she had tried to find other avenues she couldn't find other avenues for child care at night. So, by the way, just put her on the, sh the earlier shift, and why didn't you just accommodate her? And she was required to. I always had difficulty with that case from a legal perspective because I felt you knew that was a job requirement. You applied, you got the job. And what about the other people who have worked long enough not to get the night shift? So I always take look at things from a different perspective. I get that. I understood her position. But since then, there's been a number of cases that have clarified or have gone, to, there have been a number of cases that have required different fact, have required different tests. And so there's now a leading case, and some of you might want to look at it at some stage because the facts are kind of silly, which they often are when you have leading cases, and Pam and Rachel know that as lawyers. It's a Value Village case, and someone worked for Value Village, and the person worked in the back room or something and had difficulties, um, physical difficulties. Um, because the person couldn't do the back room warehouse type stuff. So they said, okay, we'll put you at the front. Uh, at the front, you can work in retail. And then the person said, eh, you know what? Retail is different hours. I can't work different hours because I have to take care of my mom because my mom's old and I have to feed her dinner. And what's interesting about the case is eventually, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter in this short time period, eventually the person was fired. Um, but the case focused on should the employer have accommodated and changed the hours for this person because the person had to help her mother. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier in, in my, uh, when I spoke with Dr. Rashawn 10 or 15 minutes ago when I said, you have to prove your case. So in this case, the employer said, tell us what the issues are. Tell us what it is you have to do for your mother. Tell us what, what time periods are. And what the employee did was said, I don't have to tell you stuff, right? And what the employee was thinking about was the, 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 the concept of when you're ill, if you're ill at the office, the employer doesn't have the right to say, I want the details of your illness because that's private. But the employer does have some right to get medical practitioner evidence that you're ill and you can't come to work or when you can come to work or what requirements there are, whatever. But you, they, don't, they don't have, they're not entitled to know what exactly is wrong with you, right? Some people will be prepared to tell their employer because it helps in a way, but there's no requirement. So this Value Village person thought, I don't have to tell you anything about my mother's illness. But the, that Value Village employee missed the point. Because in order for an employer to accommodate when you have a family issue, they get to know what's going on. So they can determine if there's a way to accommodate, if there's a necessity to accommodate, etc. And so they asked a few questions. There was always this pushback from the employee. Now, what happened was at the trial, because the employee made a human rights complaint, it was not settled during the process, so it went to a hearing, which is like a trial. And at the trial, this employee gave all sorts of evidence as to why it was that she had to accommodate her mother. Evidence that she didn't tell her employee or employer. She, didn't, she, she said she didn't have to. And as it turned out, for example, when the, when the um, employee said, well, I have to feed my mom dinner. Well, the, the, the panel said, well, like there, you could have fed your mom dinner. Just like she eats lunch, you find a way to give her lunch. Like, this has to be real. This can't just be something that isn't as serious. And, but when she finally came out with all the evidence, the, the tribunal said, you know, had you maybe told your employer some of the more detailed medical issues that your mother had, maybe they would have had an obligation to accommodate. But because you didn't actually explain anything, you didn't, but the case is, is important because it sets out the test and it goes back to that Customs Canada person case and it says, look, we're going to tell you what the test is. 
The test is that in order to establish family status discrimination, you have to do more than just simply establish a negative impact on the family need. There has to be a real disadvantage to the parent-child relationship, if it was parent-child, and the responsibilities that flow from that relationship. For example, the case said, a workplace rule may be discriminatory if it puts the employee in a position of having to choose between working and caregiving, or if it negatively impacts the child-parent relationship and the responsibilities that flow. So. That's legalese for many of you on the call, but the reality is it has to be something that's very dramatic and can't be fixed in other ways. There was another case that followed this case, and, and I know people love hearing these silly, the silly facts of these cases, <laughs> where, and again, it's usually a situation where somebody tacks on this family status, but it was um, a restaurant case where somebody was working in a restaurant, and he made all sorts of complaints that he was treated differently because of his race, because of his color and creed and all these things and he said oh yeah and by the way for family status and the family status part of it was that his wife had had an operation and he needed someone to take care of the child while she was having this operation and I think they were gonna let him have some vacation time or whatever but it didn't work out and he didn't get the time off but in the end he found a babysitter to take care of the child and when the wife came back from the operation she was able to take care of the child. So what happened was when it went before the, the hearing tribunal, they said, well, you did find a way, right? You, you didn't, it wasn't that serious that you had to choose between work and the family. You found a way to make it work. So those two cases, I think, are pivotal in us understanding when it is or how it is that the Human Rights Tribunal is going to accept that kind of requirement for accommodation. It has to be something serious. But the reality is those cases are out there and I, I could think of times for some of my partners when they've had issues or some of the associates who've had issues and for the most part in a firm like ours we just accommodate there's no issue someone's got a, a father who's dying and you have to spend three weeks with them in a cancer clinic just go is is the way you know a good employer operates um, but there are protections for you in the code I wonder if that also speaks just to like you said you know communication mm -hmm. in a sense that, that often it's being having somebody that you could talk to and and then when people understand the circumstance they're often able to help you in a, move forward and find a solution. I, I think that's a really good point because most my employer clients, um, it, it is about communication. And you know, often as a as counsel, uh, you know, I will deal with let's get to the bottom of this. But there sometimes is a strident approach with employees who just expect that they're entitled to certain rights. And as I said early in my presentation, the rights are there, but there are rules about the rights, and, and I agree with you. Most of my employer clients, if they, if they got a good explanation, they just find a way to make it work if there's a good relationship, mm -hmm. right? And, and often it's important to foster that good relationship by just being straight with your employer. And I, I think that comes up in what, what we were talking about also about powers of attorney and, and planning you know, for, with your parents. It's the families where things work out is where they've had conversations where they've sat down and, you know, whether it's to deal with the family business because one child is in the business and one isn't, and how do we balance that, whether it's one child is going to be the one taking care of mom and dad, and how do we balance that, how do, you know, mm -hmm. do we, is that child going to otherwise be mm -hmm. rewarded? And Because when they don't talk about it and they have, the parents, for example, have made dis a decision and have put something in place where, that the daughter is now getting more than the than the son, they won't. You know, once the parents are gone, they're not. The gloves those, are off. They, the yeah. gloves are off. Those kids are <laughs> never going to talk to each other That's right. again. But if they had had the conversation and explained, you know, this is this is why we're doing this. This we uh, we recognize that our daughter has hasn't been able to develop her career. Is you know wh whatever it is, then. I think that that smooths things out. It doesn't always go away, but it no, at least puts it on the table. Equally, you know, do you want to stay in your home and and making sure that the kids 
understand that and that there's the people that are making the decisions about the care are either the same or at least on the same page as the people making the decisions about the money and how it gets paid for. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. So that, that's great. Thank you. Barbara, we were talking about longevity and many older individuals, they, they enjoy what they do, they feel a deep sense of commitment to their companies or organizations and they don't want to start stop working. Can you talk to us about the changing laws around retirement in Ontario and other relevant issues related to employment law? Yes. I'll continue to talk. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I'm taking over. I'm, I'm doing all the talking now. So, um, yes, the legislation about retirement, so to speak, changed in 2006, if we can believe that. Right. So, prior to 2006, the um, the um, the Act, the Human Rights Code, allowed employers to discriminate um, against employees 65 years of age or older, which means you could allow, you could require somebody to retire at 65. In 2006, the legislation was changed, and I always giggle thinking that's because we all have to work because many of us are broke. And we can just, <laughs> well, especially for living to 122. Right. Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for that? And, um, and we all have kids, as we know now, these, this generation of kids who, who come back. Mm -hmm. You know, they go to, to, to university and they come back and they're on the payroll for years, as I say. So I kind of giggle about think, and think that's probably the reason many of us are working um, long past 65. We're, we, we're going to live longer. We still have kids on the payroll. In any event, that, that's just my, my, my thinking. But now it, you cannot require that somebody retire. That's the long and the short of it. You cannot do that. Um, some, there's some exceptions to this retirement thing. For example, some insurance policies are written that say at 65 you no longer get disability. Those things are okay. Those are contractual um, benefit policies and those things are fine and there's, a, there's an exception for that sort of thing in the Human Rights Code. But employers can't retire, require you to retire. And I have many employer clients who call me and say, I have this guy, he's 72 years old, he said he was going to retire, he's not retiring, what can we do? First of all, okay, let's talk about if you terminate his employment, not for age, he's going to be expensive. He's worked with you for 40 years, you're going to have to pay him two years plus, but let's step back, are you firing him for age? But let's even step further back, because the cases say if there are reasons you're terminating someone's employment and one of those reasons or maybe a piece of one of those reasons is age, you're violating the code. Done. So if you have a number of reasons, part of it said he's old, but let's just put that in square brackets, sorry, you're violating the code. And look, there are cases where um, the persons become older, they're not as effective in their job, and okay, let's see what happens in those cases. The Act does say, or the Code, the Human Rights Code does say, that you can discriminate with respect to age and sex and a few other of those prohibited grounds in certain circumstances. And that's if there's a bona fide occupational requirement that that person doesn't fulfill. Right, if there's a safety issue, right? Could, there, could that be a concern? That the person just, is, so for example, that it is a physically labor job. Good and point. That there's safety concerns for that individual that they can't that, the That's job. a good example because the question mm -hmm. would be, well, what are bona fide occupational requirements? And they have, so one of them, for example, let's say it's, um, let's say it's someone who drives a truck and he's been getting tickets and he's going to lose his license and, and it's not getting any better. That's the situation where you think there's a bona fide occupational requirement that you drive safely, that you don't have, you have a clean record. Sorry, it's not getting any better and we're not, we can't have you in this position anymore. Now, to show that there's, there's bona fide occupational requirements, you have to say, okay, well these requirements are um, there you're acting in good faith and that there's good reason for it it can't be something that 
that you make up. It has to be something that's done in good faith and very connected to the job. So, for example, this is a really good case example, and I thought about it um, recently. I haven't pulled up the case recently, but there, there is an example of a case where um, someone complained, and it ha didn't have to do with age, it had to do with sex. So remember I said, in certain of these prohibited grounds, the code allows you to discriminate, provided there's a bona fide occupational requirement. And one of those cases was um, where it was employees who were topless waitresses or, or <laughs> something, at some sort of men's club or something, and they walked around without their tops. It was some sort of restaurant part of one of these clubs. God knows, I don't know what they're eating there, right? But, <laughs> so, so there was a man who applied, and he said, I want the job. And they said, but yeah, it's a topless thing, right? Well, no, but you're discriminating against me because I'm a male. And my vague recollection of the case was, first of all, this is ridiculous. Someone's trying to make a point. But I think they found it was discrimination and that he should be allowed to walk around without his top on, too. It was just the most bizarre case. But there's an example of where someone would say, but that's a requirement of our job. For, a better example would be, um, I, I'm a male, I apply to be a um, washroom attendant in the female washroom, right? Well, no, sorry, that's, that's a requirement. We need females in there. That's a good example. Um, your example, Pam, was a good one too, though. If there's a safety requirement and the person's not... All right. Now, let's assume there's a safety requirement. The person's not up to the, the qualification of that safety. Okay, Barbara Miller said yes you can discriminate if there's a bona fide occupational requirement. However, there's also a hook on that excep exception in the Act. And that hook is you've got to try and accommodate, right? Mm -hmm. So if that person can't, he's older, there's an age requirement, I'm going to discriminate, you can't do this safety-sensitive position, is there a way that you can accommodate that person? Can you get someone to do a piece of that person's job and let them continue with their job? And I can tell you, because I've argued these cases on accommodation, I have spoken to the lawyers who actually work for the Human Rights Tribunal about this accommodation, and they've even admitted to me that the test for accommodation is almost draconian for an employer. Because it says that you have to accommodate to the extent of undue hardship. So that means and if an employer can say, it's just undue hardship for me to accommodate. It's just too much. What does that mean? What does undue hardship mean? And my experience with the tribunal is, unless your business is going to go down financially because you've done this accommodation, then I'm sorry, you better accommodate. And the Human Rights Tribunal lawyers have, the, have agreed with me that, like, oh my God, that's the way the tribunal operates. And I've had cases we've had to hire a second person to sit with somebody on the assembly line to go and pick up things from them because they can't walk. And I'm saying to the tribunal, but that's pain for two people. That's wrong. Sorry, you can afford it. Does it, does it, are you seeing a difference between very large, you know, co corporations and a s smaller family-run business or something? As far as the tribunal goes? Yeah, where the, that accommodation, it's, e it's easier to show that heart undue hardship if you're, you know, you're 10 people and now you have to hire another person that versus would, your yeah, Rachel, 5, that, would be, that would be a factor that I'd argue before the tribunal. Here are their financial records. Throwing yeah. another person on is going to be very difficult right. for them. Very good point. Wow. Um, so, so the age and various other prohibited grounds that are protected um, there's ways around them, all right? And there's ways around them, but then there's always that hook for accommodation. And that works if someone's disabled. Um, and I've had cases where people have been seriously disabled, they can no longer do that job, and I've said, you got to accommodate this person. Sorry, that's just the way it goes. And, and I get the concept. There, there, I get the concept because some employers over the years have just not been very nice to employees, right? Sorry, you're, you know, you've got a sore arm, you can't work for me anymore, mm -hmm. right? And that, I, I understand how this human rights code has come to be, 
but I also see how for employers it's kind of got out of hand. Mm -hmm. Now, I think what, what um, I, I, I start off that way by, by, um, by, I started off talking about really retirement and, and what happens in the workplace. And so, generally speaking, you're going to have to have employees until they decide they want to leave. And I, as I've said, I've had many cases where clients call me and say, it's, it's just not working. And I say, find a way to accommodate this person. Look, and, and I often say, let, let's just step back here. This person's worked for you for 30 or 40 years. They've got to have some value here, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you end up providing, now, it gets really testy because if you say, you cannot do that job anymore, I'm going to give you a different job. I think you have value. You can do X, not Y. Be careful because there's a whole concept in law about constructive dismissal. Mm -hmm. And you can't change the person's duties and responsibilities. You certainly can't change their wage, but let's assume you kept the wage the same. If you reduce their stature, their, 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 their duties and responsibilities, that might humiliate them in the workplace. And then they could say, you know what, I'm suing you for constructive dismissal, which is a concept in law of it's almost like you've terminated me because you've substantively changed our deal. And so these problems arise particularly because, um, I'm sorry, the person's going to be working for you and you can terminate them for other reasons, but if age is anywhere near there, sorry, it's not going to work. Now, let's go back to how you prove that. And I've got employers who who said, look, here's a whole bunch of other reasons. This is why I'm terminating him. And if he decides to do all the human rights tribunal, he decides. And then he's going to have to prove. Well, that person does have to prove to a certain extent. So if, in fact, age was somewhat of a factor and the person makes a complaint to the tribunal, it's not settled, it goes to trial, that person, the employee, has to establish what in law we call a prima facie case. That means show on the surface that there's been some evidence that you were treated differently because of your age. Then the employer has to tell the truth, by the way, and the employer has to show the records. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the thing. The, the employer has to tell the truth, and counsel will, will not represent the employer if they know different. So the employer has to, has to get on the stand and explain why and show records why this person's being terminated. And if age is anywhere a factor, it's unlikely that the employer's going to win. Um, that results often in financial, dip, financial obligations to employees that perhaps the employer never anticipated over time. But it's about succession planning in the business as well. Um, there's a case where, very interesting case, where it's not just actually retirement where age comes to be, but it's also um, termination, it's also why, why didn't you hire me, and there's an interesting case that, um, <clears throat> that um, it, it was about age and it was about someone who said, you, um, you didn't hire me because of my age. And I have a very similar case where someone says, you did, your, your employer, employer client didn't hire me because I'm gay. And it was very similar circumstances where the person applied for the job. The person in the, in the employer had a very organized structure for how they recruit. And it wasn't just, let's look at your resume, come in, talk to me. It was a number of steps. And the case I have about the gay complaint was very similar. It was a month or two long process of, you can apply, we're going to give you a test, we're going to give you a project that you have to do and, and present something to us. You're going to talk to employees, you're going to talk to all these other people. And it was, when I read the case, very similar to my, my case where the gay complaint was made. And the tribunal, what happened was, the, in the case that I read about age, the person made a complaint and said, at the end of the day, you didn't hire me, and it was because of my age. All right, well, what evidence do you have of that? And the tribunal said, wait a second, you, if they looked, and he said, you could tell by my resume because I said I worked somewhere for 30 years, so you kind of have an idea of how old I am. So the tribunal said, but they didn't reject you outright. You went through all the stages, the sequence of this recruiting process, you went through to near the end of it, and then they decided. So what evidence do you have? that? It, why would they have done that? And I have a very similar case where 
And it's almost laughable. The person went through all the stages. Then he makes a human rights complaint and said, you didn't, I, at the end of the day, I spoke to the CEO on the phone. That was the last step. And it was a five-minute call, and I knew it didn't go well. And I knew she knew I was gay, and that's why she didn't hire me. So I look at this, and I go through all the records, and I see he went through all the stages. Okay? And the, how, and the CEO looks at me and says, how do I know he's gay from a telephone conversation in five minutes? I had no idea. And so that's a case where I brought an application to summarily dismiss the claim, which you can do under the code. Uh, which was very similar to what was going on with the um, with the gay complaint or with the age discrimination complaint case that I spoke of. I think I'm running over time, which I tend to do now. <laughs> 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 anyway, Barbara, your cases are always so interesting, yeah. and we can all sit here and listen to them I know, all the day. I the one that yes, everybody yes. has. <laughs> but no, thank you, Barbara. Those were very interesting and very helpful discussion on retirement and the changing law. And I think we should move to Rachel now, last but definitely not oh. least, Rachel. <laughs> okay. And we'd like to look forward to hearing from you on the importance of estate and succession planning and general tips on how to put an effective plan in place. Okay. Take well, it thank away. you. Thank you. And I think we've I've you know, jumped in a couple of times to talk about some of the, the issues that we're seeing. And uh, um, I actually just thinking about it, you know, I, I'm not a litigator, but I do get involved in litigation issues around powers of attorney and, and wills. And I think what one of the things that we are seeing, probably because of this longevity and now more people in their 80-plus range, is will challenges are now becoming power of attorney challenges, where, you know, where par a parent feels they're still capable. They should still be able to manage their affairs. But the children have a different idea. So you can, you, you we're seeing, and I, I've been involved in a few now, where the the parent is going back and challenging the kids who have tried to take over their finances, mm -hmm. and vice versa. And then, and a lot of times, it's the the siblings, the children, fighting about what you know, what sort of care mom and dad should have, and and that. So me, I, I have a few slides in here. I don't want to really spend time, just given our time and given the fact that we have probably, I don't know. 80 questions or something <laughs> uh, that have come in. I just want to spend a little bit of time on some of uh, the issues that are on, on some of my slides. Maybe go to the, the, next, the next slide. And I think I'll, I'll pick up a bit here on powers of attorney and what they are and how they work. In, and I'm focusing on Ontario. I don't know if there are people in other provinces li listening in. But in Ontario, we've got... Uh, basically two types of powers of attorney. One is for property, where you're dealing with the finances and assets of the person, and one is for personal care. So people often think of the, the power of attorney for personal care as a living will. It's a, a lot more than that. It, it, that document deals with, can deal, certainly deal with the end of life decision making, um, but it, it also deals with things like uh, do you know, do I want to, I want to stay in my home as long as possible? I want uh, you know different types of, of care. Do you you probably get into that? Uh, and also that like how aggressive they want their care to be. Right. It's just really what their wishes are. Right. And yeah. and those are things. And this will get into what I what I want to re I think I think my main point today is you need to revisit your planning every couple of years and at different stages in your career at different stages in life um, because I've you know I've I actually had a client come in he was in his probably early 50s late 40s and was right around the time that the medical ass assistance in dying legislation had come out mm -hmm. and he came to me and he said I want that in my power of attorney and I looked at it like are, you know, are you ill? No, no, I'm perfectly healthy, healthy, but I, you know, I want that. And I had to explain to him that the law today does not allow that uh, somebody acting under a power of attorney to make that decision, go through that process for you. You have to be completely capable of doing that. Now, it may change in 10, you know, 5, 10 years. It's different in different jurisdictions, but, you know, that's what it's like today. Um, and, and I, and I was very, sh I was actually shocked that he would want to deal with that because he wasn't in that situation. But that would be something when you're in your 70s, you're thinking about more, you know, perhaps more, more uh, sort of 
focused on the, those. So, so powers of attorney, I think, would change. Where early on, you know, you're not. You you need to have somebody appointed to make those decisions for you. But your wishes around those decisions may change. So it's important to to keep those up to date. And you don't always have to put those wishes in writing. That doesn't have to be in black and white. The the legislation actually says that if you if you the person acting under the power of attorney know what the wishes of that person are are because they've told them to you then you're bound by th those so i will often i'll often tell people you know um you're if you're acting under a power of attorney and you wouldn't want something for yourself to be done that's not the that's not the question the question is what would your dad want would he want a feeding tube would he want you know, a DNR, and he may have a different sort of religious outlook or whatever it is. You need to really take that into consideration. It's what he would have want would want, and not what you want for yourself necessarily. Um, the the other type of power of attorney is the one for for uh, for property, uh, for finances, where you're appointing somebody to step into your shoes to deal with all of your assets, with your banking, and um, that that you know again as I, I sort of alluded to the person who's doing making those decisions has to be on board with the person making the personal care decisions usually it's the same people but very often it's in you know a traditional family oh it's my boys are going to do that and my girls are going to make the the personal care decisions and we have seen I've just gone through a situation. A gender where issue. <laughs> it's a gender <laughs> issue. Yes, um, but I've just gone through something where they, we had different people appointed under the two different documents and the two different and and they were completely in, in disagreement. You know, one said dad wants to stay in his house. One said dad can't afford to stay in his house. We and and it went on for a couple of months actually and you know, sort of eventually got got resolved um, so you know, on, on on that um, you know, I think it's even though when people come in to see you know, an estate planning lawyer they're usually thinking about you know I need I need a new will I need to update my will it's more than just the will it's powers of attorney it's dealing with things like assets that are held jointly you can have the most elaborate will and you know, with dividing things up and leaving leaving uh, money to charity, and but if you hold everything jointly with your spouse or your kids, those assets aren't coming out of the under the will. They're going they're going to pass. They may. I always have to qualify that because we've got a lot of cases on joint assets now. But they may not. You you may end up your will may end up not being relevant because everything's held jointly. Um, so we deal with, when we're talking to people, we do deal with uh, things like beneficiary designations, um, domestic agreements, uh, con marriage contracts, which can, will often trump what's in, a, what's in the will. So it's not just this one little, you know, you're not going to end up with just necessarily the one document. Um, some of the considerations, I think, I, the next couple of slides, and I think we should, we, we're being handed all these questions as we go, so I think I'm going to wrap up in a, in a sec. That's okay, some of the but, questions we'll have well, to answer via text right. or maybe in a follow-up, so don't do it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so really, you know, I think there are different considerations at different points in your career, in your family situation, in your, uh, you know, as people age and become caregivers for their parents. I've had a few situations where where, where the kids are, are financially supporting the parents, not just making the care, to, care uh, doing, dealing with the care, caregiving issues. Um, so, you know, they'll, we'll set up a trust for, for the parent uh, because the concern is, well, if I go first, and my husband is now, it's not, they're my parents, and we're support, we're, you know, we're we're agreed now to support my parents, but if I'm gone, and he's, it's now his decision. What? How is that going to work out? And you know, usually they'll say, "Oh yeah, sure, no problem, no problem." But there's always <laughs> going to be a, a problem in those, in those, unfortunately, in those situations. I do want to just put in a little plug for one of my uh, my colleagues who has. 
um, an Instagram, what's it called? A, I don't know. You're <laughs> looking at me. I'm not going to be Because we a talk, blog, talking maybe? about, yeah, talking about <laughs> estate planning for young families and for, you know, younger people. Um, it's uh, my, my uh, colleague Marnie Pernica has a, a, an Instagram account, I think it's called, okay. called Estate Planning 101. So for those of you out in, on this call who are in that sort of younger age bracket, you may want to start to, to follow her. And one of the things that I know she deals with the, with younger families, and it's certainly been something that I have seen, um, is when, when a uh, young couple or, or young family come in, the thing that they are worried about is guardianship. Mm -hmm. Who's going to take, they have, you know, they'll say, I have no, we have no money, but who's going to, we've got these two kids, or, you know, we've got a huge mortgage, we've got these two kids, who's going to deal with them? Um, very often, you know, you, you said there's, well, not very often, occasionally there will be a disagreement, you can see it right away, he wants his sister, she wants her brother, and, like, there's just no agreeing there, and they, you know, we talk it through a bit, and they go away, and then I see them 16 years later when their kids are 18, and they don't have to worry about guardianship anymore, but we really try to ensure that that doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, you know, people, uh, as, you know, they're, they're having kids and their kids are getting older, sometimes there's special needs issues. I, you, know, you mentioned I deal mm -hmm. a lot with families with kids with disabilities and this, the very particular kind of planning that we need to do with those issues. Um, the, you know, other times you want to look at, uh, at updating your plan would be kids are a bit older, they now move away, they all move to the U.S., that can be a big uh, planning issue. You've got at uh, one the point where I see people coming back a lot is they now have grandchildren, and they want to provide for their grandchildren because they've they've uh, provided for their kids, they paid for school, they're pay, they've paid for their homes, and now it's the the next generation. Um, or the flip side of that is they've now inherited themselves from their parents, and how do you you know do they want to protect that inheritance? Do they want to and make sure that that goes just to their children and not to um, not to the spouse. Um, and then, of course, philanthropy. Because if you don't have a will, you and you've got all these, you know, you want to leave money to charity. If you don't have it without a will that says that, that's very specific about that, um, it's not going to happen necessarily. So we want to do try to encourage people to do that and and to revisit that every couple of years. I think uh, you know that's sort of my key message: is updating your plan every, say, five years, or every time there's a there's a change, there's a life change. Somebody uh, you know, can be your the person you've appointed as your executor is now got dementia or has passed away. You really need to to look at things again. Should we we'll no, turn no. over to turn that's, back to our yes. questions? <laughs> well, actually, Dr. Rashad, thank you very okay. much, Rachel. <laughs> that was wonderful. Dr. Rashad, do you have any concluding remarks? based on working together to close this health gap? Well, I guess, you know, what else do women need to know when it comes to their health and maintaining their health and well-being into the future? I think it's important to be aware of the many gaps in health care that exist for women, and that's what I started off by talking about. Because uh, those are things that we can fix, you know, especially from the science perspective. I think those are things that we need to think about. And it's really important for women to actively participate in their health care, to be aware of these gaps, to acknowledge the unique challenges that they face, and to advocate for their own health and the well-being, uh, wherever it is, whether it's in uh, the home and with their physicians, with uh, their workplace. And I think it's really important that there's open, honest conversations um, you know, going back to the employee with your employer, which would, speaks to sort of some of the comments we, there's some of the discussion around communication. I mean, that can go a long way for people. And also with the, the people around you, we just heard about having ongoing conversations about people that are in your family or people that you may be caring for. I mean, this is really an uh, important thing that you need to do in terms of achieving a better balance and better health and allowing you to be more productive uh, over the long term. So the, I guess the more that we advocate for ourselves as individuals, the more we advocate on behalf of all women and really create the kinds of changes that we want and need to see. 
That's great. Thank you. Actually, you mentioned grandchildren, and Rachel mentioned <laughs> grandchildren as well. And that Is was one of the question? questions, Barbara, about <laughs> grandchildren. But um, again, whether or not that's more of a family issue and a family status issue, whether grandchildren, if you have to care for your grandchildren as well. But again, these there's a number of questions that have come in, and um, Barbara is Right, and I saw that question, um, and I'm going to have to look to see if there's any new law, but the family status definition in the Act is it is the status of being in a parent and child relationship. So it might just be that it doesn't cover mm -hmm. grandchildren right. based okay. on the definition. Right. But maybe <laughs> from a, from a non-business perspective, just thinking yes. about communication and flexibility in the workplace, that, you know, maybe at different times in a women's career or anyone's career, they may choose to maybe work less hours or want to work part-time. And I often hear people say that they want to spend time with their grandchildren or whatever. So, um, you know, it's, it's the idea of sort of being open to um, what, are, what are the priorities for people at individual times in terms of what they want to do and how can we best accommodate as appropriate. Right. And, and to follow up with that grandchild question, um, there's probably, I think there's certain leave provisions <clears throat> in the Employment Standards Act. If you need, a, if there's an issue with respect to your grandchild, there are leave provisions if the child's sick. There, there's leave provisions that would, would include a grandchild, but I'm not sure if the question that was asked wanted to go that far. I right. think it was more about accommodation in the workplace. Exactly, yes. And I think taking care of your grandchildren or spending time with your grandchildren probably would be wonderful for people that are close to retirement and help in that longevity and having that youth energy around. Or want to start working part-time, which is what some mm -hmm. people choose to do as well. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, um, I'm not sure, Rachel, was there any questions that you wanted to answer? There was a question about law as a second career oh, and challenges right. women face at the associate right. level, which their younger counterparts are probably not facing. And uh, I didn't know whether or not you yeah. wanted to comment on that. Um, so I just was going to sort of make a, a comment, a personal, more, sure. more of a personal comment, where I did come it, at law a little bit later than, uh, you know, so I'm about 10 years or eight years older than the people at the same year mm -hmm. of uh, in, in law as, as me, um, which I actually sort of at the time I thought, wow, this like this is daunting. What am I doing? <laughs> and you know, I've got these three little boys, and I'm st and I'm in law school. Um, but sort of looking back, I actually I probably shouldn't be saying this, but I think it's a whole. It was a whole lot easier than what I see some of my my f colleagues going through men and women who are in their 30s now having their kids. And I think that it, it I guess if there's any sort of um, advice or whatever, it's really make sure you've got a good support system. And I mean, I was lucky when we, we moved back to, uh, to Toronto when I, when I finished law school and my husband actually worked part time. And I know he's not listening out there, so, 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 but, you know, that really meant that I was able to do this, because I think a, a career like law and, and medicine, it's, and, you know, accounting and those kinds of careers are going to be really tough without a lot of, a lot of support. Um, you know, whether it's a spouse or, or grandparents. I mean, we, one of the reasons we moved back here was we had, there were grandparents here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, you really need that, that support network. Yeah, they say it takes a village, right? Yes. So yeah, it's definitely. about finding that yeah, I don't, like, finding I don't that really support. know what my kids thought about it, but <laughs> one of them did go to, is now in law school, so maybe there it was go. okay. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Rachel. Barbara, there was a question that what if the accommodation request is to work from home, but it hasn't been approved? Does the employer still have to allow it? Yeah, the, the question um, is, a, um, is, I think, generally about accommodation and working from home. Uh, when when the, the question asks, if it hasn't been approved, does the employer have to allow it? Well, it's the employer who approves it, right. so the answer would be no. But I think the question probably relates to can I make that request? What are the rules around that request? Well, working from, and, and I've, it's a reason we want to answer this question because that's a question that often comes up where employees say, it would be better if I could work from home. Um, here are the reasons why. A um, good example is I had a case yesterday, coincidentally, where the person is clearly disabled. It was a discovery I went on, and I represent the employer, and I could see 
um, very clearly this woman is in extreme pain. She's not faking it, she is hurting and she's had certain diagnoses. And one of the questions one of the co-counsel asked was, could you work from home? And I remember thinking when I was listening to her, watching her and thinking, if that was my employee, um, and I was at, you know, and I had to try and figure out how to help her, that would be a case where, because she says, I'm in pain, it's more of a fibromyalgia, there's all kinds of nerve problems, and listen, I've had, you know, a small nerve problem once, and I understand how painful that can be, and, and this is something this woman has to live with. She said it would work for me sometimes because I could lie down for half an hour, or I could, you know, walk around and have, like, you know, do things, walk around outside for 10 minutes. And that's an example of where if, if, if there's an issue and that will work for you and there's evidence that will work for you, then the employer should allow it. And if you don't, it, it, but often in cases like this, it, because it's often a workplace injury, so workers' comp is involved, and when workers' comp is involved, then they help with suggesting remedies and accommodation, and the employer pretty much has to respond to workers' comp and accept what they say. But, but working from home is not a right. That's just the way it goes, okay? And it's funny enough that for years, the last number of years, employers have been working towards, hey, let's save revenue. Let's not have space. Let's have you work. Now that is changing, I can tell you. A number of the large corporations are shutting down the working at home for a reason that I've always thought made sense to me and something that Dr. Rashawn said because you talk to people in the office. You are not isolated. You share ideas. It's those unexpected conversations that aren't going to yeah. happen if you don't you know, Absolutely. And it happens, Pam and, it, it and Rachel, in, my, in our yeah. business. I run mm -hmm. next door. Oh, my God, what do you think about this? Do you think I'm being unreasonable? And then the person will ask you a question, and there's two brains working on something. Mm -hmm. Or you think of something you hadn't thought of, and it's not going to work working from home. Mm -hmm. I, I, I Personally, I'd go insane working from home. I don't like the isolation. But it would have to be it would have to be something that was fairly justified. So you have no right to work from home. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of accommodation. And the example I gave about the person who's very ill, that would be a case where I would think a court would say, that will work for her. If she can get her job done, mm -hmm. let her work from home. That's great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, Dr. Rashawn and Rachel, for that wealth of information. And it's an important starting point for many to consider to thrive in your career and increase your longevity. It has been my privilege today to moderate this articulate and intelligent panel. And thank you out there for everybody listening. And there will be a follow-up email that will be sent within the week, and it will include the HRPA code and CPD information. As well, one last um, pitch here is there's an upcoming webinar, Tuesday, April 24th, Workplace Wellness and Mental Health, Emerging Issues, Effective Management. Join Erin Burles, legal expert, as they discuss and address mental health issues in the workplace. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you.